Hello everybody and welcome to the next in our occasional series of BTRM video interviews. And this afternoon it's my great pleasure to welcome onto this, uh, this BTRM video interview uh, Ms Sana Ragbeer who is Group CRO with First Citizens Bank in Trinidad and Tobago. Okay, so Sana, welcome. Thank you very much Murad, it's a pleasure to be here. Very glad that you could join us. Now we're going to spend maybe 15 minutes or so just talking about uh, key challenges and mm -hmm. key issues for a, a CRO, a group CRO, particularly with an emphasis on the CRO who's holding that position at a systemically important bank or a designated systemic uh, uh, important bank. Now Trinidad and Tobago isn't as uh, global economies go the largest economy in the world but nevertheless whatever jurisdiction one is in a bank that has been designated by one's supervisor regulatory authority as systemically important presents particular issues and challenges and we're going to talk about that. But before I do Sana perhaps you could just let us uh, let us have a a brief run through of your 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 career path uh, up to now up to your position now. How how is that where where have you come from and how has it got you to where you are? Sure, thanks a lot. Um, so I have been with First Citizens for about 11 years now. Um, prior to that, I actually started my career on the buy side of the investment management industry. So I'm actually coming from the buy side, the business side. You know, very few CROs actually do have that business experience, but I do come from the, the business. The first line um, is where my most of my career has been. I did work prior to joining First Citizens with Deutsche Bank on um, what was one of their risk areas as well, the loan exposure management group. So I saw firsthand how Deutsche Bank would have managed their loan portfolio. Um, I've been in the CRO role at First Citizens for about two years now, and it's really part of the leadership training and development program where they rotate their senior leaders as part of the succession planning for the group. So it's been a great experience and I continue to add value to the organization. Okay, thank you very much for that. And that's quite an interesting program that you just highlighted, the fact that they rotate their senior execs. Yeah. I can see straight away some benefits of that, give, give an individual an all-round exposure. Okay, sure. fantastic. Great, thanks very much. Okay, so let's get right into it. The first question I had for you in your role as, as Group CRO, uh, of First Citizens Bank is, what would you consider for the for 2022 or for the next 12 months or indeed for the medium term, next three years, what would you say your your top issues, your top risks, uh, the, your top concerns are uh, right now and in the medium term? Let's say top three to start with. So top three, let me start with the next 12 months, Murad. I think, and I'm not going to speak only from a banking industry perspective, I think all CROs really should be focusing um, on three main key risks at this point in time. Um, first of all, digital transformation. It's been there for, I would say prior to the pandemic, but the pandemic has obviously accelerated it. So we now have digital transformation on our radar. And with digital transformation, we do have to understand the investment that needs to be made for all organizations. What's the cost? Where is that funding gonna come from? How are we gonna manage that? We also need to look at skills. Does the team have the skills necessary for digital transformation? And what are businesses doing and our business doing to ensure those skills and training? And then, of course, the change that needs to happen, not just in the organization and the management of that change, but with our consumers, with society. How are we managing that whole transformation process? So I think digital transformation, one big risk, Obviously, with that comes the second risk, cybersecurity. I don't need to say more about that. I think that's on everyone's mind, um, regardless of your industry. Um, and it's more importantly, not just preparing ourselves to protect ourselves against cybersecurity, but how to respond in the event of a cybersecurity incident. And then the final risk in the 12 months, I would say, is really the world is moving to a place where we are emerging from the pandemic. What is business going to look like? What is your business, our business going to look like? Um, we have to prepare for that revival, that recovery of, of businesses. Um, how have consumer habits and expectations changed since the pandemic and our businesses set up for that? So there are many questions that can be raised. I mean, we see the global supply chain, um, the risk associated with that that's coming out from the emergent from the pandemic. 
Um, over the next three years, though, I still see digital transformation. Cybersecurity is still going to be on top. Um, I do, however, see a shifting now to climate change. Um, all businesses are going to have to look at climate change. How do we adapt our business models for that new climate change for regulations that will be coming? How is it going to affect your business? Um, in the banking industry, we have to prepare for standards, reporting. Um, so consumers are also going to be pressing many businesses to ensure that we are, we do have climate change as one of our goals. And what are we doing to contribute to that goal? So um, I think those are, would be the emerging risks, but that will be a big emerging risk in the next three years. Right, so thank you very much. And I must admit, I, I wouldn't disagree with the importance with uh, uh, attached to any of those. Uh, before I go on to the next question, interestingly yeah. for me, I, um, I notice you didn't have good old fashioned balance sheet risk on that list. I conclude from that that, um, that uh, you know, capital, liquidity, interest rate risk, you've got them wrapped up so nicely and comfortably at First Citizens, they're not a concern. Would you say that's, I'm being uh, a little bit too superficial there, or would you say, yes, you, you're comfortable with that, which is why it wasn't on your top three? Well, I would say it's not, it, it is a top risk, it's just not my top three. <laughs> but always, for especially being from any banking industry, as you know, as you know, Murad, I, we have to look at, uh, at our liquidity, our capital, it's key. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's there, it's definitely there and will always be there as a top 10 risk. But your top three, those are like, what I see as it's different as well. It's not your standard traditional risk. And that's what makes it even more um, of a challenge for many CROs because we also have to wrap our heads around it and make sure we understand what's happening there. Yeah, absolutely. No, quite right. Well, it never, never comes off the radar. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Now, let's just uh, talk about the, the role of the CRO or uh, with uh, at a globally systemically, not globally, systemically important institution. As I mentioned at the start, uh, your regulatory authority, the, the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, designates first citizens a bank as a nationally systemically important bank. So that has uh, that specific concerns associated with that. It's same as in any country when the regulator uh, 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 designates them as systemically important. From the point of view of the, the CRO, what would you say are additional concerns or additional um, challenges that come with the role of being the CRO of a systemically important bank compared to, for example, a CRO of a bank that wasn't so designated? Um, I think one, the first one that pops out is we are always working with our regulators, regulatory compliance. We always have to ensure that we're just on top of our game. We don't, we don't miss a, a deadline, a submission. It's critical that we ensure our regulators are extremely comfortable with us um, because we are so important to, to the economy. And um, so that jumps out. It's always making sure we have programs set up to ensure proper regulatory compliance. I would say as well, our uh, reputational risk. We always have to look at our brand um, and everything we do, we always have to think about two or three steps down, down the line. How is this going? How is this decision that we're making affecting our customers? Um, how will it affect the society? Is it in line with government policies? Um, is it going against what but um, wider organizations are trying to achieve. We always have to think of the consequences. So it's always about managing reputational risk from that aspect. Um, I would say as well, we always have to be ready for any disaster scenario, whether it's a cybersecurity threat, um, a national a hurricane, earthquake, because we do have to ensure that we have business continuity plans are, are operational and we can be up and running because again we have so many customers who are dependent on us so we do need to make sure we are we can be up and running and just have very little downtime of course there's capital and liquidity more i can't forget that i mean our regulators would systemically important we have to ensure that we have strong capital adequacy strong buffers in place um a proper risk assessment liquidity we are always monitoring our liquidity metrics we do have to be a little more conservative in our liquidity in marginal liquidity than most other banks. Um, and finally, I would say generally, strategically ensuring that as a, an institution, we are always preparing for that future. 
preparing for the next step um, so that we can remain viable, remain a going concern and continue to be successful. No, absolutely. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's a that's a, I was supposed to say it's a good answer, but in so, it's good in so far as I'm, I'm learning as I listen to it. So thank you for that. Also, um, there's something on your list of uh, risks that isn't necessarily on the list of, say, a UK bank, which is hurricanes. They don't really <laughs> CROs in UK banks aren't too concerned, whereas, of course, where you are, I can see why that sure. would be on your list. The uh, the con business continuity has to look exactly. into has to have something for that. OK, right now. Thank you for that. Uh, now, the next question I was going to ask was, uh, specifically the role of the second line of defence, which of course you're, you're in charge of that function at First Citizens. M my personal definition of the second line of defence within the concept of three lines of defence was that it was the, the function, the role, the body that was responsible for independent oversight, review and challenge. Now, that definition is not too controversial, but what about, the, and from an operating model perspective, when the second line was also holding the pen or managing the ICAP, the capital adequacy in the ILAP, the liquidity adequacy processes, how do you think that definition needs to change or does it need to change? Would you say it's still accurate, that definition, or when you're holding the pen or you, you know, your team is holding the pen for ICAP and ILAP and recovery planning, does it need to be modified at all or is it still good? There's no contradiction. Um, so it's a great question, Murad, because I mean, it was something when we were rolling out and implementing our ICAP, which we had to work on last year, um, because, you know, we, we, in Trinidad and Tobago, all the banks are now required to do the ICAP. And it was a, a discussion that we had internally, especially between finance and risk as to who should hold the pen. And the reason why, when risk decided to hold the pen, I think we did not see it as a conflict we actually saw it as complementary to what we do as a second line of defense we saw that the icap allowed us to really build and enhance our existing risk models to really um focus on quantifying different risk across the organizations in a way that we may not have previously thought of so it actually caused us to be a little more analytical in our models really refine existing models, build new models. So we've come up with new models for strategic risk or pension plan risk, you know, so build new models to really look at areas that helps us now to quantify the risk. And I think the ICAP has allowed us to really look at developing an integrated, a truly integrated approach to looking at risk together with capital and profitability at the same time. And as you know, ICAP has stress testing. It's a key component of ICAP. And I think the stress test is very complementary to the second line of defense because by us doing the stress testing, we were able to see the results really highlight key risk, high risk areas in, in the group and then employ risk mitigation techniques and strategies there. So I actually saw it as very complementary for the second line of defense and very appropriate the second line of defense to actually lead the ICAP process. <laughs> okay, thank you. And, and I stand corrected. I might have to <laughs> modify my own, I might have to modify my own approach in this uh, now that on the basis of your answer. Thank you. Now, just uh, one last question then. We were talking about the second line of defense. Um, we, that whole concept, which is a good few years old now, uh, I, I don't know, 20 years, if not longer, that whole concept of the three lines of defense framework, first, second, third, yeah, and the third, of course, being the internal audit function, uh, is that your own your own personal opinion? Just your personal opinion. Is that still um, is that still um, fit for purpose? Is it still adequate? Is it still what we need, or is it now outmoded given emerging risks, given the way that banks, you know, the new environment, the change environment the banks are in now compared to twenty years ago, or is it still is it still fit for purpose? Does it still work? What do you think of the framework itself? Just a personal opinion. Um. My personal view is I think it still works and it's still needed. Um, I do know that we do have um, the three line model that is being spoken of now, you know, so we've heard of that, we've seen it. My view is I do agree that the first and the second line of defense as we knew it and will know it in the future will become certainly more collaborative. I think they will there's going to have to be that balance. It's no longer a first line, a second line, like a strict independence. But the, the first and second lines will always have a role to play, but they will have to become more collaborative. 
um, especially in the digital world. I think in a world, and I'm speaking now from, this is where I put on my banking industry, from a banking industry perspective. I can see in a digital bank, in a digital world, there is that need for first and second line to certainly be more collaborative, to work together, to make sure we achieve both objectives. The objectives of ensuring we have returns profitability, but you balance the risk on the other side. And I do see that second line will continue to play a role to monitor, to, um, to report, and to ensure that balance is achieved, but it will certainly be more collaborative and about creating value as opposed to just Defense, three lines of defense. It's not just about being defensive anymore. It's about how can we work together to be collaborative. I do firmly believe the third line will always be needed and they will always remain independent because you do need that independent audit function. And especially in the banking industry, you will always need that independent third line. So they will always exist, that third line, and continue to remain independent. But certainly going forward in the future, more collaboration with first and second line, but they will still exist. Okay, that's a very clear, very clear uh, answer. Thank you for that. And uh, I'm, I personally think, yes, it's, it's not just about the risk management and control. It's also about, you mentioned the word viability, which requires P&L, which requires return on capital, since the collaboration is important. Uh, and I, I one doesn't often hear that so much. Um, and and I, I Personally, again, I, I think going forward with the, the challenges, the competition in the banking environment, I, that, that becomes vital if you're going to have a very efficient operating framework. OK, great. Thank you very much. Short and sweet. I've, uh, I've enjoyed the conversation. Uh, I hope we can reprise it again uh, sometime. Sana, uh, real, uh, real privilege for us to have you on this short chat with us. So thank you for joining us. Thank you uh, very much. I enjoyed it. No, it's my, my, our pleasure. And so thanks, everybody. That was uh, Ms. Sana Ragbeer, who is Group CRO from uh, with uh, First Citizens Bank in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, this is the BTRM video interview series and uh, wishing you a pleasant rest of your day. Thanks very much and bye bye.